my name's Nick Jennings and I'm the Vice Provost for Research here at Imperial College London. And uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to introduce the lecture. I wanted to congratulate you all on actually making it till six o'clock on this time on such a, such a hot day. So really well done. And I'm sure you will be riveted and kept awake by the lecture, but try really hard because it is incredibly hot out here. So this is uh, the Energy Futures Annual Lab, which is the uh, annual lecture, which is uh, the flagship event for the Energy Futures Lab, which is one of our six global challenge institutes here, here at college. And the aim of the institute, the lab, is to bring lots of, of the research groups around college together uh, so that we can present ourselves both to the outside world and we can sort of coordinate coordinate ourselves uh, internally as well. So the Institute's a really important part of the landscape of multidisciplinary research here at Imperial. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce tonight's lecturer, uh, Professor Christoph Fry, who's someone who's had strong involvement uh, here at Imperial. He's been here a number of times. He's spoken here a number of times. For those uh, who've heard him before, he, he assures me that it's been updated since he last spoke, so, so there is something new coming as well. So Christoph is the CEO and Secretary General of the World Energy Council and has an excellent background uh, where they look in the policy aspects, economic aspects and technology and how these all, all come together around areas such as uh, energy and climate policy, uh, the energy water nexus, and the future of utilities. So it's sort of something that very much fits with the, the aims and objectives of the, of the energy future. So I'm going to hand over to Christoph, who's going to talk to, about us, to us about grand transition, digital revolutions, and new energy re realities. Christoph. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nick, for the kind introduction. It's a great honor to be back at Imperial. Thank you also, Tim, for all the preparatory work for that. Um, some rumors say that many of you have found it back into this, or found it into this room because it's one of the very few air-conditioned rooms <laughs> at Imperial. So I'm grateful for the hot uh, weather outside. And very pleased to see so many here today. What I would like to do in the next 30 minutes or so um, is give you a sense of what we mean by grand energy transition, what the role of digital is behind that, and where it leads us. I'm going to do this in four parts. I'm going to first introduce simply big picture thinking, you know, kind of what, what are we saying here with grand transition, give you a kind of an intuitive approach to it. In the, second base, in the second part, I'm going to show you what 1,300 energy leaders from 90 countries think about those issues through a survey. So how do they think of what is most important today and how has the thinking changed over the past five years? Quite dramatic changes, you will see. The third part, I'm going to present to you briefly how we translate that thinking into scenarios, our musical scenarios. And in the last part, I'm going to put a bit of VEC judgment on top of this. What is our value system at VEC? I'm going to uh, present the trilemma, what we call the trilemma, and how we judge you know, policy in countries, how we judge those scenarios, well, how we uh, hopefully contribute to making the difference between good and bad policy and a positive way forward. That's going to be um, 30 minutes. So let me start right away with... Um, the intuitive part. When we are saying grand transition, what we mean is, first of all, there is a context that is profoundly changing when it comes to the growth reality. And underneath that context, there is three fundamental driving forces that drive change in energy. Let me first talk about context and about those three drivers. Context, growth context, over the past 45 years, we have seen global population double. Over the next 45 years, we will see an increase of global population of only 40% in the mid-scenario. 
If you are saying, why does this matter? If you are saying that annualized GDP growth over the past 45 years, you have multiplied GDP by a factor of 4.4. That is roughly 3.5% average growth rate. Half of that annual growth rate comes from labor market growth. So what happens if you take 60% out of labor market growth, 60% out of half of what was the growth engine, you take out 1% of the 3.5% overall growth. So slowing down population growth will cost us 1% of 3.5% average growth. And if we do not, by increasing productivity growth, you know, bring that back, then we are in a slower growth context. Underneath that, we have seen acceleration of decoupling of energy from GDP. GD energy has increased while GDP has increased by a factor 4.4, only by a factor 2.6 over the last 45 years, which translates in a, in a decoupling of energy from GDP if you take the average of 1.1% per year. Over the past years, we have seen an acceleration of that. Last year, actually, we published, or this year, we published with the UNSC for all the tracking framework that the, the productivity growth has been 2.1% energy productivity growth. So we have decoupled um, energy from GDP growth by 2.1% rather than the 1.1% average. What, I'm, what am I saying here? We have slowing down global growth at least the possibility, unless we are really fast in productivity growth, and we accelerate the decoupling of energy from GDP growth. Where does it lead us to? The question, when are we ending up in demand peak in energy? So that's the context. The demand peak is something that is close to reality, and we have to ask, when is that? Now, under that context, we have these three drivers that push for change. The first one being climate change. Climate change, I'm leaving, I'm going to leave you with three figures that are really summarizing this issue. First one, we, if we want to achieve the two degrees Celsius world on an average growth, GDP growth scenario, we have, if we have over the past 45 years decarbonized um, energy with 1% or GDP with 1% per annum decarbonizing GDP with 1% per annum, we have to accelerate to achieve the two degrees Celsius on it to 6% per annum. That's not evolution, that's revolution. Let's be very clear. It's no small effort. Second way to describe the same thing, so from 1% to 6%, the first number you should keep in mind. Second figure, we have, in terms of discovered fossil fuel reserves, we have the equivalent of 2,800 gigatons of fossil fuel, of equivalent CO2 emissions in fossil fuels, coal, oil, gas, discovered as of today. If we want to stay below the two degrees Celsius warming, we are allowed to burn 1,000 gigatons. So we have a factor 2.8 more in discovered resources, fossil resources, than we are allowed to emit. Third observation, Paris, with the nationally determined contribution, has delivered us a third of the way that it takes to get to the two degrees Celsius scenario. The commitments take us a third of the way. So what I'm saying here, I think the first challenge is, it's not about evolution, it's about revolution. It's a factor 2.8 more um, CO2 emissions that we have discovered in terms of fossil fuel than what we can emit. And it's this one to 6% uh, acceleration. That's the climate challenge. It's a massive driver. Second, the second driver for change is new business models. And not only business models driven out of climate. They're driven by, and I have listed 10 trends here. I'm not going to go through all the trends, but I'm going to address a few of them rapidly. First, we have obviously the whole question of past where we focused on centralized systems and big plants, and we are shifting to a system where we are going much closer to the customer. The big marching is moving from the resource closer to the customer. 
which makes the big data and managing the customer in a, which is much more granular, obviously, a key essence of future business models. We are seeing in the past, we have seen high entry barriers if you wanted to be a player in energy. Why is that? If you wanted to build a big plant, if you were not a big player, you couldn't do it. You didn't have access to the capital, the project management skills, etc., etc., etc. Now, you can, as a small player, start doing your own, being the uh, renewable decentralized plant, etc., on a rooftop, etc. You can build your platforms that enable the building of those, the, there's many business models out there that allow relatively small players to become part with l very low entry barriers. In the past, it was, if you were a, 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 an energy company, it was all about technology and operational experience. It's much more shifting to this, um, uh, the, the question of data intelligence and the service experience, being again close to the customer. Last point I'm going to make before I move on. If you think where we are, have been in the past, it's about, it was a lot about burning molecules in energy. 80% of today, today's energy still is fossil, 80%, burning molecules. If the future is about much more um, uh, renewable technologies and capital intensive energy efficiency measures and nuclear and, 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 those are all not burning molecules, but capital type of things. And you need the capital mechanisms that deliver those. If it's decentralized, if it's platform solution, things like leasing models, etc., will be much more important in that context. So they, those are a few trends that we clearly see. That I've listed the other ones, but the sh long story short, we see a big shift of the logic, how business models are driven, and those are a couple of trends. Let me quickly focus on digitalization, just because digitalization is obviously one of those areas that drive many of those um, business models. We see currently four areas in digitalization that really impact energy. First one, the first one is if you think about the internet of things in energy and what it can do, enabled by blockchains supported by many metering devices. What is this about? It will allow, the, the objective or the, the, the vision is that there is a possibility for devices, appliances talking to each other and function on the basis of smart contracts. Let me give you one example. Let's assume your fridge has a smart contract that tells him you have a range of temperature, you, you must stay within temperature you know, between four and six degrees, whatever it is. But within that uh, freedom that I'm giving you here, the four to six degrees, you have to always buy electricity when it's cheapest. And the fridge, as such, becomes a storage device in the system and optimizes his small P and L, profit and loss, on the appliance level. This is enabled by the blockchain, which makes basically, what is a blockchain? It basically allows close to zero marginal cost transactions um, and that would deliver us the internet um, of things in energy. The fridge talking to the solar cell of the neighbor, talking to the battery of the, of the other neighbor, etc., and through that, delivering a system that is locally optimized. We have seen already um, first pilot cases. This is the Brooklyn microgrid um, pilot, and there's many, there is dozens of startups, there is probably, one can almost already say almost hundreds of startups, but it's clearly dozens of startups in this space that are working to this, towards this blockchain-enabled internet of things, and this is clearly one area of massive um, innovation. The other area I want to quickly highlight, this is the innovation uh, enabled by digital, it's not only affecting first world type of thinking, it has profound impact also on developing countries. Developing countries, we have um, 1.1 billion people still without access to electricity. 1.1 billion. 86% are rural. 86% of the 1.1 billion are rural. Now, we have made very little progress on the rural side. While we can, the world can claim, and many developing can claim, there was good progress on the urban side. On the rural side, we are very slow in making progress. Now we have over the past years, and this clearly wasn't there five years ago. If you're asking what is leapfrogging in energy, what was leapfrogging in cell phone industry? Leapfrogging was 
bringing cell phones to places where you had no wires at all. And people within very short time, without need for centralized infrastructure, had access to the same services that previously country had to go through a wiring, the, a coppering up of the, whole, of the whole country. That was leapfrogging in cell phones. So can the same happen in energy? A couple of years back, we would have said, you don't understand energy if you even ask that question. <laughs> now look what happens. We see this is one example. This is a picture who got delivered a system by one of those rural entrepreneurs. The rural entrepreneur, you know, what is the, the model here? The system, what is it? It's a solar cell, a battery, a fridge, a cell phone charging station, a ventilator, a lamp, uh, a computer, you know, and all of that for $300. Delivered to a household who cannot pay $300, who lives from two to three dollars a day, but who is spending 60 to 80 cents every day for paraffin and candles and other energy, kind of basic energy, or was at least doing that so far. And is now spending 40 cents a day to pay the lease for this $300, and after three years, will own it. How is it enabled? By his cell phone. His cell phone bill goes up by 40 cents a day. Very simple financing, very effective solution. Yes, those entrepreneurs live for an extremely thin margin, 0.01%. Take this as an order of magnitude. Extremely thin margin. But this is private money. It's not development money, and that means it's scalable, and it has already reached millions of people. This is one of the leapfrogging things that we see in energy in the rural area. And think of what it does potentially to learning curves. This drives cheapest solutions for metering devices that are installed in that. Two dollars the meter. How much does it cost to have a meter here? Probably a factor 100. This is two dollar meters. It delivers learning curves on um, the things like battery, like solar cells, like the device high, high efficiency, um, DC appliance systems, etc. This drives learning curves. So first point, driver of change, climate change. Second point, new business models. Quickly, the third point, which is resilience. We have new risks that affect the way we think about energy. Three areas, extreme weather, cyber, and energy water. I'm going to only talk quickly about extreme weather. We have seen over the past 45 years an increase of a factor four of extreme weather events. If you're in the Philippines, if you're in Latin America, have seen Philippines with, with uh, typhoons, in La Latin America with El Nino. If you have seen those extreme weather events, you know that you think differently about energy infrastructure after those events. You will think about how, make, how to make a system more resilient. The long story short is, if you put the resilient thinking together, we are coming from a world where we have built oaks in energy. We have built for things to be stronger. And we have seen some of those oaks going down, and then what do you do? It's very hard to build up, to bring up an oak again. And we are moving to a place and you know the, the La Fontaine story, which beautifully illustrates that, of the reed. The reed is decentralized, has black starting capability because it stands up by itself. It has all those local empowerment uh, because, again, every, every reed stands up by itself without needing for a central kind of thing. All those characteristics we are looking to replicate in systems that are to be more resilient in the future. This is the third driver of change. So three drivers of change in a different growth context. The climate, the new business models driven by digital for much of that, and um, the new resilient thinking. That's part one, the intuitive. Let's measure. Let's measure how we see the reality of that with 1,300 leaders that we annually survey with our issues monitor in those countries. You see we have quite global coverage. And we surveyed them on 41 issues, 41 issues in three dimensions. We, we say, we ask three questions, basically. What is the impact of the issue? What is the uncertainty? And how urgent is, is the issue? 
what are the issues, the 41 issue? If you had only, if you had to restrict yourself to 41 cluster terms, to summarize the full energy story, what would be those words? What are dry, that's the 41 we tried very hard to come up. We have worked many years to come up with a minimal set of cluster terms in energy that really tell the story as a whole. We can call them drivers in energy, we can call them risks in energy, we can call them visionary aspects of te critical technologies in energy. It's those cluster words that really help us tell. And so we measure that once a year, and here is what the latest map tells. This is, the first of all, a global map. I'm going to show you the global map, quickly explain what is on there. I'm going to show you a bit of the biggest dynamics, and I'm going to show you some national maps to see differences. What do we see on the global map first? What keeps high uncertainty, high impact people most awake at night? The critical uncertainties here in orange. Essentially, it's macro issues. Essentially, it's things like economic growth, huh? the different growth normal that we have seen. Um, it is commodity price volatility. Um, the, not only for um, oil, also for gas. You have seen all the efforts behind OPEC, the fact that we have really as a world probably said, as council we are saying as well, there is too low an oil price. If the too low oil price really harms um, the producing countries, we see slowing down economic growth globally as well. And you know, the tensions that arise from that, they speak for themselves. So there is also too low an oil price. We see climate framework uncertainty you know, still be strong and uncertain, and even more so since we have um, heard tones from North America. Um, we, we see regional integration and the lack of regional integration hampering the efforts towards more sustainable en and more resilient e energy systems, and that is critical. And we see innovation issues such as electric storage already being very high on the critical uncertainties agenda. What are the critical action items? Renewables efficiency, electricity prices in a context of aging electricity infrastructure or in the context where you need to expand infrastructure. Those are it's a concern everywhere. Huh? Electricity is not coming cheaply. Uh, and I think this is always a policy issue. And then the subsidies context, not only ex exiting from the fossil fuels subsidy, but also dealing in the right way with the renewable subsidies. So this, is, this should not be a big a surprise. More interesting than this is asking the question, what has most dramatically changed? And if you look at the biggest changes over the past five years, electric storage, digitalization, decentralized systems, they come all from the nowhere space. Huh? Those are the establishment, the energy leaders establishment, the 1,300 people. They have five years ago not really thought about those issues and they now say it's absolutely core center part of the agenda. Market design, renewable energies. Renewable energies is probably slightly different because it has been up there for some time. What is the key message here? It's the new business models. You can clearly see on the previous, um, you have seen the growth reality, we have seen the climate uncertainty, here we see the new business models. What has gone down? CCS, carbon capture and sequestration. Not happening unless we are putting really serious policy frameworks in place. Clearly not happening. People do not believe, while many say, and we say it as well, this is critical if you want to believe in a two degree Celsius scenario. But it's not happening unless we are serious about it, and we, frankly, are not. Unconventionals, unconventionals, well, that's a short story. It goes with the oil price. If oil price will go up, those, this goes up again as well. Nuclear, more complex story. The nuclear outlook is one where we see greater concentration uh, into countries where there is real and strong government backing behind the agenda, and other countries are giving up on it. And you have just seen the, the case of Korea that has made in the, uh, the past days uh, a critical shift of agenda there from the policy side. Coal, globally it's becoming very difficult to finance new coal projects anywhere. Even though many countries still heavily rely on coal, globally it becomes very tough to finance new coal projects. You can see that here. So let's quickly dive into a few countries. Um, Germany, the Energiewende country, hey, what are, you know, you see the digitalization, decentralization, market design, storage, the innovation agenda is absolutely top 
not much surprise there. Um, you see some of the risk like cyber threat totally up. I said before, resilience is one of them. So in a country like Germany, more broadly in industrialized countries, cyber is a number one type of issue. You can see it here. China, you know, if you look at what, I'm, I'm, I'm emphasizing only what is really standing out here. Energy water nexus is one of the top action items. The link to water, the question which technologies are not costing more into the water issue that China already has is a critical issue and drives technology um, um, selection. Obviously, digitalization, there's, uh, there's also an, an innovation agenda. There is the cyber threat question as well. And obviously, China is still heavily dependent on coal. But the environmental agenda defines much of what China is doing today. UK, you know, there's a lot on regional coherency. It's about trade barriers, regional integration, EU cohesion. Is anybody surprised? Cyber threats. Clearly, one is a country also very concerned about cyber threats. And then the innovation agenda as well. Digitalization, electric storage, um, very high up in the UK as well. So those are, give, gives you a sense of, yes, different thinking from one country to another. But overall, the macro trends, obviously, that I've shown you are globally relevant. There is much more innovation. There is uh, a sense of new business models coming with that. There is uncertainty with climate um, uh, framework globally. There is resilience, but the resilience, and that's the key message on resilience, is not the same everywhere. Cyber is more on the industrialized country. Energy water is typically China, Middle East, Australia, and then the extreme weather events. Think of Asia Pacific, um, um, parts of Latin America, post El Nino, parts of Africa, etc. So the, the, the resilience agenda is critical, but not the same everywhere. Now, let me come to scenarios. I think what we have done in the first two part, saying what is the transition, intuitively we have seen how the leaders think about the transition. Now, let's formulate that transition. We do it in three scenarios. We call them jazz, symphony, and hard rock. Modern jazz, unfinished symphony. And what I'd like you to do is, really, I'd like you to buy into our concept of what those terms are and play with them when you walk away, as many do in the meantime. What is jazz? Jazz, you have somebody you know, who gives the beat, huh? and then you have the best instruments that take it all. They go and they, they play. Huh? That is the beat is basically what the markets provide in this scenario. We say it's enabling, um, the enabling power comes from markets at national level, but also through international trade. And the best instrument, the best technology will simply outperform all the rest. It's a market-driven scenario that delivers it to the consumer cheap and now and has a lot of focus on innovation. Second scenario, the unfinished symphony. Symphony has a director, huh? the government. The symphony, symphonic, the director has a long-term vision. He wants, he wants this to be beautiful. He wants it to be uh, you know, he goes for prosperity objectives, long-term prosperity objectives. This includes things like climate change, but also equity issues, etc. And he orchestrates, he intervenes. He chooses perhaps things like e-mobility because it looks like this is a, a good contribution, even though markets may not immediately call for that. So the symphonic orchestration is the second type of scenario. Third scenario, all of both of those take muscle. Muscle to put trade rules in place among countries, or muscle to put a climate agreement in place among countries. What if you don't put muscle? Huh? If you withdraw from those things, you, you're more inward looking, it's more fragmented world, it's more you know, letting it go and focusing on national interest type of world. That's what we call hard rock. And I'm gonna quickly show you what that does. So it's about national security, not trade enabled, and not climate framework enabled. Now, if you're point one, I said, let's keep the different growth context in mind with the introduction. We are saying, and this is very, this is a, actually looks very easy a term, but it's a very, um, it has many layers. 
primary per capita energy demand will peak before 2030. Primary per capita energy demand. Underneath that, you have structural shifts, you have all kinds of shifts, you have, uh, the, um, so, but the essence of this point is primary per capita um, demand will, based on the growth uh, context that I've said as well, um, uh, will impact overall thinking on demand levels. I've already er elaborated on those issues for the sake of time, I'm not gonna repeat that, but this is the first strong message. And you see, Symphony is the one where this happens quickest and Hard Rock being the black one is the one where it happens slowest. Electricity is the new oil. The big game is gonna be in electricity. We see a doubling of the volume in electricity by 2060. Doubling of the overall consumption from today about 23,000 terawatt hours, almost doubling. Because it's gonna feed some of the transport, some of the industry needs, the cooling and the heating will come increasing with heat pumps from et etc. et cetera. So electrification of final demand is critical. And so that, that's the essence of point two. Within the electricity side, the renewable success story, particularly wind and solar, is continuing. We see by 2050, I've, we, we see, if you look at hydro, uh, we see a contribution of 14 to 16% from hydro, and we see from, um, a contribution from wind and solar for 21 to 42%, depending on the scenario. Now, this, this from a starting point, from 4%, in 2014. That's massive rollout and if you add it up, the hydro, solar, wind together will make up to two thirds of electricity production by 2060. Fourth point, what happens to fossil fuels, coal, oil, natural gas? Coal has essentially peaked. We are the greatest likelihood beyond the coal peak. Oil will peak before 2040, not supply. There is no peak oil. When we spoke about peak oil in the past, is what, uh, it was about peak supply. What we are saying here, oil is peaking because we have, what is the major driver of oil consumption? Most of it is transport. Huh? So if transport finds other, other fuels, that's the biggest driver for the peak oil question, and we see basically before 2040, we see the peak, um, uh, oil peak. Anecdote, two weeks after we said this, OPEC followed. We said it at the Congress, OPEC, and that was, it's quite surprising, huh? OPEC for the first time said, this is gonna peak before, you know, possibly in the next decade, which was a more ambition formulation than we, well, what we have used, but they have clearly acknowledged that as well. And you can imagine what this means for members. What does it mean if oil peaks? What do you do about the resource that you can no longer produce? Stranded resources, you know, this changes the whole dynamics of how you think about the long-term value of resource and will incentivize a totally different behavior in the short term. That's to be kept in mind. Natural gas is the only um, resource that still is growing. I, I see I run out of time already, I'm, um, but I will continue briefly. Five, transport. By 2060, we see up to a third of the low duty vehicles, so the individual vehicles fueled by electricity. Is that a lot? We see biofuels also be, be, uh, um, building their share, particularly in the equ equator type of zone where you have easy access to actually the fuels uh, in the equator region of biofuels, outside much less. And we see also hydrogen coming into the play. So the win, that there's no clear winner in the game around the, at least not in our scenarios, around the game, the, the transport market, and the key message here is it's actually the hardest one to transition. Transport is really the hardest energy segment to transition because there's lots of individual choices in that and it's not simply top down. What does it mean for overall CO2? This is the IPCC line that basically tells the two degree story. What 
would the emission trajectory have to look like that we stay below two degrees Celsius? And those are our scenarios. Symphony, jazz, hard rock. None of our scenarios is getting us into two, two degrees Celsius. Well, that's not very good news. What is the good news? The good news is every time we are redoing the scenarios, we are actually getting a little bit closer. Why do we call it unfinished symphony? Because we are unfinished as we are not getting there. What brings us every step a bit closer? We systematically underestimate the power of innovation. Huh? We still systematically underestimate. If you go after this with pure economic modeling, if you ask why have you always underestimated solar, there's so many co-benefits that the economist is not easily looking at. Co-benefits, I have it at home. It gives me social status. It, it, helps me, my, it helps me secure, even in a blackout context, I may have still energy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It helps the rural agenda. So there's so many side benefits that are simply not, not as simple as being translated through where, how much is the cost and what does it mean to an average market. And this co-benefit analysis is one of the areas, one of the reasons how we explain why we fall short in innovation. But it also means we have to continue the acceleration trajectory if you want to um, stay into the two, two, two degrees Celsius uh, world. Now, how do I said, how do we measure, how do we value, you know, what is our value system? We call it the trilemma. We say, if you want to judge uh, energy policy or a scenario in terms of do we like it, don't we like it, then we should do it in three dimensions. We should look at Energy security, we should look at equity, access, and affordability. Can, it, can households really pay for it? And do, we, do they have access? And then the environmental sustainability. It's not only climate change, it's also local pollution. Those three have to be in balance. Why? There are three political constituents that drive energy agendas almost everywhere. There is households. If they cannot pay for it, they will go on the streets and vote for the next government. There is industry, if, you, if they lose you know, energy security, they will make sure there will be another government. And there is environmental groupings, you know, look at even in China now today, the number one issue is environmental agenda. Um, and many countries, those are very important contributors to government selection process. What does it mean if the government changes? The next government will do it totally different because you have neglected that community. The next government will respond. We call that policy risk. Investors hate policy risk. So bringing balance into this is the only way to get investors in the country and help you finance the transition. So that's the essence of the, of the trilemma. So while transitioning, you need to stay balanced in those three dimensions. Otherwise, you will simply not manage to do it. Now, um, the scenarios. Quickly, how do we judge them? Jazz is best in delivering energy access because it has the steepest learning curve and it delivers solutions cheaply. Again, cheap and now it's jazz. Symphony is the best in terms of emission reduction, but it's more expensive and therefore is slower in bringing access to the, the, the rural entrepreneur will, have, will, be less, uh, will be less successful in symphony scenario. And hard rock, frankly, is more dirty, less secure, and more expensive. Why? Because we haven't put the learning. What is a learning curve? What accelerates a learning curve? The learning curve is accelerated through volume, independent where it's coming from. If you put volume behind it, the more volume there is, the faster the learning curve. And if you don't do trade, we don't have learning curve acceleration. If we don't do climate change, we don't have some uh, climate change framework. We have certainly a slowdown in the technology choice toward, towards a, a cleaner world. And if we do not acceleration, we still fall short. So the key message out of this, while needing to keep Paris alive, we clearly need to also emphasize trade, technology trade, and think of the domestic content side. That's not a priority, actually. If you think about the equity issue that we fail, if you don't go after the acceleration, then it's not about the local content first, at least not in the critical technology um, space.
It's about learning curves first. And um, the innovation acceleration, let's be very focused to make sure we leverage the best technologies. I leave it with that. Um, thank you very much for the attention. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Christoph, let me very briefly introduce myself. My name is Tim Green. I'm director of the Energy Futures Lab. Uh, Christoph has kindly agreed to um, take some questions, so um, I will uh, help manage that a little bit. So if you'd like to ask a question, please indicate in the normal way. Uh, please wait for the microphone to get to you, and please uh, very briefly just, just state your name and affiliation. So come into the front row first, please. Thank you. My name is um, Kings Melbourne from Trusted Sources. Uh, thank you. Very impressive um, uh, summary of your views on the transition. Uh, my question really is, w when was this put together? Because um, I, I suspect it was a number of years ago, and the, the, because your, your forecasts with respect look extremely cautious. Um, and and the, uh, the, the, the idea that only 20 to 40 percent of wind and solar would be, would be um, Sorry, only 20 to 40 percent of electricity coming from wind and solar in, in 2060, uh, or, or, or sort of 9 to 32 percent of transport from uh, from um, uh, non non oil sources in, in 2060. You're both actually extremely cautious in, in light of the very significant cost falls in wind, solar, and batteries in the last two or three years. So, I, I guess my, my question is, and clearly you can't talk too much outside the brief, but um, given the very rapid falls since I suspect a lot of this is put together. What might you change, and, and, and do you think that actually this this um, this summary could could turn out to be uh, exceeded very rapidly, as of course has happened to many projections of the energy future uh, in recent years? Thank you. I think it's a very fair. Thank you for that. It's a very fair question to ask. We have obviously we are re renewing the scenarios every th three years, roughly, and so we have. The work that, and if you do it globally and you want to keep the, the global kind of thing, so you lose all this, you know, we have published it last October, but frankly, we have worked on this, um, you know, two, two, three, uh, two, two years ago huh? uh, on the data side. And it's just fair to say that we, you know, systematically continue to underestimate the power of innovation. But while being cautious, let's not turn this into the other thing. Let's not become you know, just satisfied with the speed. Even if you add the innovation dynamics, I would not be convinced that we end in a safer zone that we are today. And so I think the key message is we need the focused effort on things like trade to unleash learning curves, in, on things like Paris to ensure that climate agreements are intact and actually implemented and brought to not only one third of the solution, but to the full story. And that at the same time, we are very focused on some innovation areas. Batteries is one, and there could, the digitalization area has lots of opportunity to really be sure that we get into the safe zone. So the message, I don't think, does fundamentally change. On the data side, I'm with you. You know, I think on the innovation side, there's always good news to come. Thank you. Over this side, please. Hi, um, Jeff Hardy from the Grantham Institute here at Imperial College. Um, I'm interested in the survey data and particularly electric vehicles because I didn't see them particularly featuring in the right-hand side of that chart, but it might just be my poor eyes. Um, so what I was wondering about, is it, is it an issue that's coming through. I see batteries are there. I wasn't sure if electric vehicles were, so it's kind of middling, isn't it? So um, given the impacts of that sort of fleet replacement in the 2060s, that feels like a very big issue coming up on people's plates. So first, our observation, that really, I think it's an important question. If he, I should have brought Latin America data of innovative transport, you can see it here, and that includes the way we described this, it's a range of innovative transport solutions, which includes hydrogen, biofuels, e-mobility. And when we look at the regional, when we go into greater depth with that and go by region, it's, it's interesting to see that, for instance, Latin America is not much about e-mobility. Huh? Latin America, they do have massive biofuel potential. And they really think it's, it's all about biofuels. In parts of Asia, 
you know, the belief of hydrogen is, is much greater than immobility, etc. So you have to be very prudent in thinking that um, it's only an immobility agenda out there. Clearly, the battery prices that are going down is the critical thing to observe. But until emerging and developing countries can benefit from a rollout, not only of second generation cars, but also an infrastructure that fuels them, that's not just an easy trajectory. So that's while, yes, we see great dynamics on that side, but it simply does take time for that, that dynamic to translate in all regions. Thank you. Uh, ben Burson uh, from the Centre for Nuclear Engineering uh, in Imperial. Um, you mentioned briefly in your introduction that nuclear has a part to play, and I guess the question in the transition space, how can we enhance the innovation offering from nuclear, and how can it adapt given how fast the, the transition and the innovation pace is? in the energy market? Well, the nuclear, if you, I, if you look at the data side first, we see actually that nuclear is still increasing um, probably by a factor two to three compared to what we have today. But the concentration of the, in which countries we see nuclear is also increasing. So we see a reduction. We, we see stagnation in Europe. We see acceleration in Asia. If by 2060, we expect 60%, up to 60% of the newly built nuclear plants being built in China. By 2060, up to 60% of the newly built nukes in China, which delivers basically up to 50%, or will bring us to a place where up to 50% of the globally installed nuclear in two countries, China and India. And that obviously, you know, again, looking at the Korea story, clearly nuclear is not just a technology question. It's a perception question. It's a, a capital, long-term capital commitment uh, question. It's a question that in a context of increasing threats and security, cyber terrorism, et cetera, is under pressure. It's, we have seen cost exceedings, et cetera. All those things have not helped over the past years um, to, to make a stronger case, and I think um, yes, there is lots of innovation thinking. It's, is it modular nukes? Is it, um, you know, through that uh, standardized lower cost, etc.? But those things have been discussed for many years and the pro progress is not fully there today. I've heard from process systems enterprise. Uh, I'm interested in the modern jazz scenario. You mentioned it had the steepest uh, learning curve, so therefore you would expect the highest level of reduction on, on the emission side. Uh, or sorry, but also the, the, the quickest peak of uh, uh, fossil fuels in that, in that respect, if I understood correctly. Now, my question is, uh, if, let's say, if we think about the record that markets have at implementing these technologies, or, or let's say the succession of peaks, you know, booms and busts in, in the sector you know, for a long time, and the fact that subsidies have played a substantial role in getting renewables out there and, and actually bringing those uh, cost curves down, what is the key change that you see going forward so that these markets become m more efficient or more efficient than they have been so far and, and, and find that stability of the price signals that you need in order to force those markets? Well, first, it's very important to, th to say that empowered market, unleashed market, but without carbon orientation is not necessarily only delivering better carbon-free results. Huh? If you have seen, let's quickly look what were jazz stories versus symphony stories in, in technology. Solar was a symphonic story that has translated into a jazz story today. I think solar is today totally jazz today. It doesn't need, any symph doesn't need much symphony today anymore. But initially, without the symphonic intervention of Germany huh, in particular, um, um, it wouldn't have been accelerated to the, to the extent. And China, because if we had a market that unleashed the China innovation curve, the market globally delivered the volume. So this was a, a combination between symphonic push from Germany with the globally jazzy context that enabled China. Very, very special context. Um, if you think about shale gas, shale gas was to some extent, yes, there was a little bit of symphony as, symphony as well because you can say the tax environment was favorable to domestic production, but essentially the technology development was jazzy. Huh? It was a jazzy development. So jazz can de also deliver solutions on the fossil fuel side. And if you don't direct that with the carbon agreement, jazz by itself may not, the just empowered market, 
deliver cheapest technology, best technology, but not, not necessarily the most climate. Uh, so it's important to think of what is the right combination here. I think that's, uh, th that's probably the uh, essence of the learning of the scenarios. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Naima from Africa Alternative Energy Initiative. Um, my question actually is on, it seems your focus has been on um, Western countries. And I just want to know how these um, dimensions or dynamics will translate in an African country context in that um, dimension. And then again, if you could skip to where you have the various scenarios, um, jazz and symphony, if you could skip. I just want to raise something in addition to that. You mean? Yes, um, because one thing that we we came we've come to understand in most of um, the African countries that we've been working with is as much as about majority of its rural people do not have access to electricity, they are more particular about how do they also raise local content when they have these countries coming in. So if you could throw more light on this, I'll very much appreciate it. Thank you. First, we, with our trilemma, we rank 125 countries and we rank you know, many of the African countries as well. And, and the, shortest, uh, you know, the shortest story is if you're saying that the biggest problem is on the rural side. The biggest problem of the 1.1, if there's different levels of issues, there's the, obviously the pollution side, there's obviously the, the lack of quality of supply, the brownouts, et cetera, that you have also in the urban side. But if you, say, if you quickly focus on the rural side with, with the 1.1 billion, half of them in Africa, um, you know, being the, the, uh, the, the biggest issue, the, the most pressing issue, then let's dive into that one. If you are looking at what, what development approaches have done, and, uh, and the, you know, I don't want to sound negative at all, but top-down does not work in the rural context. Huh? Top-down has simply failed to deliver in the rural context. Not pilot-wise, there is great many successful pilots, but bringing it to scales, if you, need, if you want to do it with development money, there's always an end to development money, and that is the limit to scale. Huh? Now, what happens with those new rural entrepreneur models, I should go into some details. Those entrepreneurs, and again, there's a few dozens of those, they are very specific in which countries they can bring this, their models to success. And what is there? We have interviewed about a dozen of those and asked them, so what are the critical success factors for them? If they live from 0.01% of internal rate of return, they want sharp money. They say they want you know, equity money. They don't want development money because it's, it's lazy money. They call it lazy money. And the, you know, quote, they, they don't keep those entrepreneurs sharp. But if it's only 0.01%, just guess what it does if you have an import duty. If you impose local content in areas where technology can be cheaper from China. Or if you have high administrative burden that make the, that life, the life different of that entrepreneur. It is the difference between going to a country or not going to a country for such an entrepreneur. And that is really, it's a very, we had, we brought actually at our Congress, we brought 12 of those entrepreneurs together, and some of them are African, by the way, um, 12 of those entrepreneurs together with um, uh, 12 uh, policymakers in Africa. And uh, we had 12, uh, you know, institutional investors, equity investors, um, development investors, etc., in the same room. And, you know, one of the most, there were a few beautiful moments. One of the moments was when one of those entrepreneurs said, we don't want development money, we want sharp money. It keeps us sharp and we need to be sharp. Uh, but the other beautiful moment when, the, when was the K Kenyan um, regulator said, look, people ask him, why are you successful? And Kenya is one of the success stories in this context. Why are you successful? And the Kenyan regulator said, look, what it takes on the rural side, we have always tried to solve it with lots of regulation. We have taken the opposite approach now. We just let those guys do the job and we want to watch them carefully. We want to see when there is a problem and if there's a problem, we need to come in and solve it. But in the meantime, as long as they can, we want to make their life as easy as we can because they live from so, so, so thin a margin. And that's, I think, you know, again, there's no, there is no universal truth in that issue, but the, those observations really are interesting in the, in the rural context. Okay, so I see one question at the back, which we'll take next, I think. Uh, 
Hello, Becky Moorhood from the House of Commons. Um, I joined a couple of minutes late, Christoph, so I apologise if you already covered this. But I was interested that you noted that CCS has fallen right off energy leaders' agendas. But there's an awful lot of energy system models that still regard it as critical for us to meet our 2050 targets. And so I was wondering, in light of the reducing of interest, do you think it's still realistic to expect CCS to play an important role in decarbonisation? And if so, what changes will be needed to put it back on the agenda? We have seen many companies, you know, saying this, seeing this as a big opportunity. And probably a good part of those companies have closed down their CCS departments. Why is that? There is successful pilots. I've seen this pilot at Bayer. You know, Bayer, uh, they have a CCUS, carbon capture utilization sequestration type approach, where they make CO2... Uh, plastic out of CO2. In other words, they use 20% of the input requirement that otherwise would come from fossil fuels. They use CO2 instead. And it works commercially. Now, the questions you have, asked, you have to ask is, what are those projects that under current frameworks can really be successful, commercially successful? It's things like enhanced oil recovery. You get more oil out of gr the ground if you pump CO2 into it, and that's a business case. Or you can uh, replace, like, buyers 20% of the input requirement, therefore have a uh, cost-benefit case. If you add all of that up, you simply don't get anywhere near, you know, the, the volumes that it takes. Without a financing mechanism somehow, and I'm not even calling it carbon price, but without a support mechanism that is clearly helping CCS to get to scale, it's not going to happen. And frankly, leaders who give up on this, they tell us, you know, we simply do not see the effort of governments to align on this and give us that effort. Let me give, let me give you one, a few numbers. Just size of the problem really matters here. We are talking about 30 gigatons, more than that, you know, depending on which number you want to look at, which time frame. But just let's fix, uh, fix our cell phone with 30 gigatons uh, annual emissions of, uh, of, of, of CO2. Let's just assume, could we build cities with CO2? Could we translate all of that in construction material and build cities? How much cement do we use every year as a world? 3.4 gigatons. How much steel do we use every year? 1.5 gigatons. How much grain do we eat as world population every year? 2.4 gigatons. So, while we, if we were able to, and we are not today, to translate all the CO2 in steel, um, cement, or the equivalent, build cities from that, and have lunch from CO2 while doing so, we would only have done 15% of the effort. This is a massive issue. It's just a very big issue, and without a very big effort, we are not making a dent. And that very big effort is simply not in sight. And that's the call we just made at the um, Clean Energy Ministerial. To be frank, to, it, it was very, you know, people acknowledged, ministers acknowledged it, and say they want to put it on the agenda again. But up to now, the leaders that we survey don't see this effort. Okay, so very soon now, Christoph will have answered questions for as long as he talked. So I need to wrap this up in the following way. I'm going to very quickly, if, if we could, take brief questions from uh, this gentleman, this gentleman, and that gentleman, and then perhaps you could respond to the three in a group and, and we'll draw things to a close. Thank you. Um, Adam Chase from the consultancy for tech. Um, I, I want to sort of stick my neck out about something that I think will be on your next map of issues, which I, it may be implicit there, but it's critical materials and processes. I, I think that the optimism, and, and, and it's not misplaced, in things like the lithium-ion battery and electric vehicles and some of the other solid state technologies is highly reliant on materials which have very concentrated supply chains and very narrow, uh, thin resource bases. Uh, for example, lithium ion batteries. Currently, they come out of cars, they're incinerated. You know, that cannot stay. There is no known, really, economic recovery process for, the, for those materials. Other things like that, I think, are potential constraints and a fantastic need for innovation, by the way. Uh, Alfred Kuma, electrical engineer, London Underground. 
uh, do you think the rather slow internet speed in this country is a threat to this topic? Um, uh, yeah, just two rows back from the... Yeah. Jonathan Wax from Genesis Energy. You made a quick reference to the oil price. And I just wonder if there's going to be a bad feedback loop there because you mentioned there's a lot of resource in the ground. And I just wonder if the people who own that are going to have different game theory kind of incentive just to sell it at a much lower price rather than leave it there and if that's going to change all the scenarios. Great question. Well, on the material side, I can only say I totally agree. I think one of the things when we look into the electricity, and by the way, if you talk to the hydrogen people in the, in the car industry, their case is very clear. They say, we believe in hydrogen because we don't believe the recycling or the materials uh, will really be up to the scale that we need in, for electricity. So that's one of the arguments of the hydrogeners or the, the, the car manufacturers that bet on the hydrogen side. And it's, I think, an important one to keep in mind. Can we tell today, frankly, uh, recycling innovation may come as well because it's going to be a business case. So we, you know, but, but it's a very good one to observe very clearly. Slow pace, every, you know, frankly, in our ranking, the UK is the triple A. Huh? The UK is still the triple A. But clearly the, the biggest, the weakest, or the, the area that is most under pressure is the whole question of energy security. Yes, there was some, some uh, issues around affordability, but those have cooled down a little bit. But the security side with aging infrastructure, um, on the one hand, plants that are being decommissioned, etc., not really all of them uh, replaced. Uh, the question now, how is the integration with Europe going on, which may also ha have um, uh, supply side questions. So those are very important issues and they need to, ha need to be tackled, obviously, um, in a context of a country that has a AAA and certainly wants to do everything to keep it. On the oil price, on the oil price side, this is obviously a fascinating one. If you if quickly go back to ask the question, you know, what is the, 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 you know, the, the economic fundament of a cartel like OPEC, then it's too short to say it's just about price control. It's obviously if you decrease the volume, price goes up. But that's only one reason why OPEC was you know, kind of the thinking that led to OPEC. The other thinking was Hotelling's theory that said, on top of that, what you do not produce today will have a greater value tomorrow. So the marginal cost will go up. So you are actually double incentivized to not produce now. Your immediate price goes up and your reservoir gains in, in value. Now, let's quickly say, what if the opposite happens? If, the, if with every unit that you're not producing, you're actually going to in a future where the value of your reservoir is going down. What would you start doing? You produce like hell. You want to probably sell parts of your um, resources on the international market to share risk. You want to probably do all kinds of things to save your bets in that way. And in the short term, that will lead to pressure on the oil. Uh, not short, short term. But we have, I should actually say on the midterm, that will lead to a system that will put pressure on the resource price and therefore on the production speed uh, of oil. Okay, so in a moment or two, I'm going to invite you to join us uh, in the foyer area for some refreshments. Um, just like to make a few remarks. So, uh, Professor Jenkins, uh, Jennings, sorry, when introducing you, remarked that uh, we, we've had the pleasure of your company on this campus before, and I think we've seen this evening why uh, we were so keen to invite you back for this annual lecture and to. Uh, to have you talking in front of a larger audience. You deliver a, a great wealth of material with, with tremendous passion, both from, from the high-level view and a global perspective and down to detailed comments on technology. So I thank you very warmly for that. And, and um, I have to say we had a very interesting conversation during the course of the afternoon. There are many opportunities, I think, for those of us on this campus to engage with, with WEC uh, in, in various ways. So if there are particular points you, you notice today and you want to pick up on, um, you can get in contact with us in the Energy Futures Lab and we can try and facilitate some, some interactions. I think there's some great opportunities there. Um, you know, sometimes in a vote of thanks, one tries to kind of summarize key messages. I think there were so many messages I would hesitate to attempt to do that. But very interesting that you, you, you talked about the power of innovation and the unexpected 
pace of some innovations. You know, for, for a science and technology-led university, that's a terrific um, message to take home. And I was also um, pleased to see that amongst the list of items coming out of the survey, talent, and, and presumably, therefore, a concern of a shortage of talent was, was up there, high-ranked um, amongst the things, and again, a terrific message for a university to address. So uh, I'd like you to join me uh, and thank Christoph for a wonderful lecture. Thank you. Thank you.